Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Earhart, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, I'll help get you started with Worksheet 7, an introduction to data. So I scroll down to the timetable, Class 7, here's our worksheet. We will be working off of this website and using um, R to answer the questions. So first thing I'm going to do is download the QMD file. To my ADA folder. I will open that up in our studio. And knit it or render it. And we'll take a look at the output to make sure that everything looks good. Oh, let me also turn off my uh, it's annoying. My Dropbox synchronization. All right, this file is, it probably opens up automatically for you. I need to not look there, but here. And I've got my number seven HTML. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, we have nine questions. All of them are worth one except for the last, which is equal to two. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of help in this video, but I'm not going to tell you every answer. Okay, most of the, I will help you with most, mostly I'll help you with the R code. Okay, um, let's go back to the web page. Not there, here. And open the intro to data lab. We'll make this a bit bigger. Okay. So I'm going to let you read through some of this. Feel free to pause the video at any moment and read read the text. But the data set is from 10 years ago, um, the a random sample of domestic flights that departed the three major New York City airports, uh, JFK, LaGuardia, and the third one. <laughs> uh, I should know what that is. Um, okay, uh, we a I've actually created a data set for Albuquerque um, airports. Uh, this is a bit of a, an aside at this point, but I will show you where to find it if you're interested to do a similar analysis for Albuquerque. Where are all my packages? Repositories. Sorry, I'm looking at my, I'll bring it over here, <clears throat> at my GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash Eric Earhart, there is a repository. Um, I should look for flights. Flights Albuquerque 2017. So I, I created this data set when I taught a data visualization short course for the American Statistical Association. It's uh, very similar, except it has, I think, all of the flights in a 10-year period that departed from Albuquerque. Okay, almost 300,000 flights. So if you want to use data for Albuquerque, you can do that as well. Um, it won't be good for this assignment, but it'll, it might be fun for you to, to play with. All right, so we'll load these, these two packages, um, uh, the tidyverse for doing the tidyverse syntax and the open intro data set, which or a package that gives us the the flights data set. There is a video here for creating a reproducible lab report. You do you can skip that because I'm giving you the template for the assignment. All right. Um, the data is called New York City flights, and let's go take a look. So the, the, this is a pretty nice data set. It's um, simple. It's already constructed for you. Uh, it doesn't have multiple tables that you need to join together as a relational database. Um, those are skills that we're not going to learn in my class, but are good skills to know about. All right, so let's in the, I guess I think what we did last time is we worked in the um, editor window and we submitted commands down to the console. So I put my cursor on the line, I'm pressing control enter to submit the those commands down into the console and I've got no errors so far. 
Oh yeah, one thing that's important is to set the working directory. Um, it's not always important. It's not actually it's not important in this case, but oops, yeah, set working directory to source file location. So now it's it's looking in the in the folder where we have the QMD file. So if we were to read files or write files, it would be looking in the right place. All right, so we start with um, this data set. Let's go take a look at um, the data set. It has those variable names, year, month, day. You know, that's sort of okay. It might be better to construct a single date um, variable that has all those fields together, um, as well as the time. You can create a time, a date time variable that has all of those together. And then it's got the departure delay, the arrival time, arrival delay, which carrier, that's like American Airlines, Delta Airlines, things like that, the tail number, uh, flight number. So the tail number identifies the airplane, the flight number identifies the route that the airline is taking. Um, origin and destination are the cities. Um, how much time in the air, the distance flown in miles, I think. Um, I think the air time and delays are all in minutes. As, um, and then hour and minute, I'm not sure what that, oh, that might be this year, month, day, hour, minute. Um, okay, uh, if we look at the structure of this data set, or you can do a glimpse at it, it has 32,000 observations, those 16 variables, M most of them are numeric. We have some character strings, like the, the carrier and the tail number. Um, these tail numbers all start with N, which is November, that's the designation for the airplane belonging to, to someone in the United States. Canada is letter C, and every every country has, has some different designator. Um, these are the origin airports. Um, these are the destinations. Lax is Los Angeles, and so on. <laughs> I don't know all of them. Um, OK. So we've got, we've got a data set we can work with. Notice that the departure delays and arrival delays can be positive or negative. Right, so a delay is negative if you left a few minutes early. All right, let's head back to the website. Um, here are the list of the carriers. Okay, it looks like there's about 15 of them or so. Um, oh, let me just show you that. Um, so we've learned things like um, if you've got your data set and you put a dollar sign, you can type the variable name and print out just that variable. Here I'm not going to press enter yet because I don't want 32,000 rows to, to appear, but if we then pipe that to a table, we can get frequencies for each of the airlines, um, and we should be able also to sort that. Um, so United Airlines has the most flights. B6, let's B6. Blue Jet Airways has the second most, and then EV, Express Jet, okay, and then Delta Airlines, American Airlines, and so on. Um, OO had only three flights. Uh-oh, that's SkyWest. <laughs> I think you don't want that to be your designated, designator for an airplane. Uh-oh. Oh, I'm hilarious. Okay, so let's take a look at um, this first question that that we're coming up to. Okay, the analysis. All right, so first we're going to look at departure delays. And they've got some code here for making a histogram. All right, so let's just go ahead and copy and paste that into the console and see what our histogram is. And we'll also take a look at the code for this. ggplot, we specify the data set, and then we need to um, assign variable um, variables to visual attributes or aesthetics. So in this case, we're assigning to the x-axis departure delay. And we are choosing our geometric object is a histogram. Um, this only has one, one axis because when you do a histogram, it creates a second axis by creating bins on the x-axis and counting up the frequencies for each uh, for each bin. So we've got 
you know, 26,000 or so um, that are within this first bin, and then they taper off um, quite quickly. Although the, uh, what is the maximum departure delay here? Because um, let's do max. Okay, sorry, I, I shouldn't have edited a previous line. So I'm looking at the New York flight's departure delay variable and looking at the maximum. 13, um, 101. All right, so if we, if we want to do some math arithmetic, we can divide that by 60. 21 hours. Oh. Okay, it's one of those horror stories, being in an airport for almost a full, full day. Um, all right, so that is one example of a histogram. They go on to um, set the bin width for the histogram. So that's the width of each bin. So the first example has 15 minute bins, right, quarter hours. And the second one has 150 minute bins. So that would be two and a half hours. So let's, uh, the code that I've written here creates the first plot, right? We've got bin equal 15. The second one is bin 150. I'm assigning the first one to P1, like plot one, and the second to P2, plot two. And then I'm using this patchwork program to create a grid of plots. And the slash there says that I want to take the first plot and put it over the second plot. So here we've got our two plots. Let's uh, increase our plot size. And right, I hope that you uh, are identifying which of these that you like more, right? Which one is more informative? So let's see what the question is. Look carefully at these three histograms. Oh, I guess we should, we need to put in the first one as well. All right, let's do that. I didn't do that in my original code, but we can do it now. Um, and we can count from zero. In fact, probably the easiest way to do this, I copy my previous code and just make that P0, oops, P0, and then take away the bin width argument. Okay, it's the same code. And then we've got, let's do P0 over P1 over P2. Let's see if that works. All right. So the default, I think, for the histogram, oh, yeah, it says down here, is to use 30 bins. So it finds whatever the, the range of the x variable is, divides that into 30 equal units, and that's, um, that's the width of the bins. But I, I always recommend you set your own bin width because whatever this bin width is, it, it could be like 17 point three minutes or something. Not, it's not very interpretable. Choosing something, you know, that's an integer that's easy to interpret is the way to go. Okay. All right. I'll uh, save a couple of my other comments. All right. Are features revealed in one that are obscured by the other? Okay. So I think you'll be able to answer that. So I've got a comp, I've got a bullet point up here, delete this text and write your answer. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, if you want to visualize only delays of flight headed to Los Angeles, right? So destination equals Los Angeles, then we can filter. So there's two there's two uh, functions in the R tidyverse. Uh, one of them is filter, where you are selecting which rows that you want to keep. The other one is called select, and that's when you're selecting the columns you want to keep. Okay, so for rows, we want to select, we want to use filter, excuse me, to choose those rows. <clears throat> so we're going to start with the data set, and then, right, so you can read this pipe, the words and then, or then. Data set, then, filter, keep the destinations that are equal to LAX. Notice we have a double equals. Recall from the, the R videos that I have that a single equals does an assignment and a double equals does an, um, a Boolean comparison and returns true or false. So wherever this equals true, destination is equal to lax, those are the rows that are going to be kept by the filter function. 
they're assigning that to a new data set, LAX, for Los Angeles flights, and they're going to plot a histogram of just those flights. Same thing, just departure delays. Okay, so that is um, um, how to read the syntax. All right, we've sort of talked about some of this stuff. Um, there are other Boolean operators that you've seen before. Not equals to is exclamation point. Um, th that's just fine to do. Um, I have a small comment, but I'll skip it. Um, sometimes you can do greater or less than, or you can do greater than or equal and less than or equal. Right? <clears throat> and you can also obtain some numerical summaries. So let's see what the... Um, Oh, here are some, here's the list of the numerical summaries. O only some of them. You can calculate a lot of your, your own as well. One that's really important to know is n parenthesis, which will count up the number of observations in the group that is being summarized. All right, we're getting to our, we've got two exercises coming up. All right, you can also filter based on multiple criteria. When you filter and you specify one of these and then do a comma and a second one, the comma is representing a logical and, okay? Um, so we want those that started in San Francisco, or where, excuse me, the destination was San Francisco and the month was February, okay? Both need to be true. All right. So, um, blah, blah, blah. If you're interested in either flights, okay. You c the vertical pipe, vertical bar, right? Shift backslash by your backspace or enter key. Um, that is the or. So if you wanted to do either the destination was San Francisco or the month was February, you could put a, you could put a, put a vertical pipe instead of a comma there. Now, you would get all the flights in February, regardless of their destination, and you would get all the flights in, to San Francisco, regardless of their month. Right? That's what OR means. All right, let's take a look at these exercises. Create a new data frame that includes flights headed to San Francisco in February and save that to this data set name. How many flights meet these criteria? All right. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go over to our studio. Okay, it looks like they probably gave this to us already. So this, this code right here starts with the data set, New York flights, then filters it for San Francisco and month equals two. So we've got this new data set now. And if we look up our in our environment, we'll see this here and actually the answer is right there, right? 68 observations. Um, we could get that in a number of different ways. We could um, look at the data set and like we could look at the structure, okay? And the top row of that is 68. Um, we could uh, we could do, we could look at the number of rows. That's n row, okay, 68. Um, we could use, uh, let's see, we could pass it to summarize, and we could use the n function, n equals the number, and we, we could print out that result. It creates a, a table where n is equal to 68. So we've got lots of ways of finding the number of rows in that data set, or the number of flights, right? Each row is a flight. Okay, um, let's look at question number three. Describe the distribution of the arrival delays of these flights using histogram and appropriate summary statistics, okay? Hint, the summary statistics you should use depend on the shape of the distribution, right? So what, what summary statistics in terms of the center and spread would you use if you had a symmetric distribution altogether? Very good. 
And then what would you do if you had a skewed distribution when you've got a long tail? All together? That's right. Okay. Mean and standard deviation for symmetric and for skewed, median and interquartile range, IQR. So let's look at our histogram and, oh, we're going to have to make a histogram. So we'll go up and grab our some histogram code that we've already used. Let's grab one with the bin width so we can try a few plots and choose our, our best. All right. And we've got this new data set, SFO Feb Flights. All right. And we are looking at arrival delays. So that was, um, well, I know it's ARR underscore delay, but let's look at the structure. That will help remind us. I'm sort of taking you through like what the workflow typically would be for me. So I start with the data set and here is arrival delay. That's the variable we want. So I'm going to copy that into my X variable. So we're plotting the data set arrival delay and we've got a certain bin width and we're going to print P. Okay. So is this symmetric? So we want to use the mean and standard deviation or is it skewed? So we want the median and interquartile range. <clears throat> this is a tough one. It's basically symmetric, except we have definitely one outlier out here, 200 minutes. And we've got these two other ones that are a little bit on the, on the right tail side, but otherwise it's pretty symmetrical. Uh, the problem is that this one in particular is going to really pull the mean out to the extreme. And so um, probably the the median may end up being a better choice. The median is going to be close to the center of this peaky distribution. Uh, let's see what other um, bin widths might be good. Let's let's see what it looks with for five minutes. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe if we did 10 minutes, right? You sort of ex experiment a bit. 10 looks pretty good. Um, I feel like I have, I'm getting, right, the t the wider your bin, the smoother your histogram. So you want to you want to have it be wide enough, right? So if I make it down to one minute, you want it to be wide enough that it's not real noisy like this is, where you you're sort of smoothing out some irregularities, but where the the features um, of the data, like that, there's these these two individual points out here. There's actually like a little little bump on that right tail. You know, you don't, you want those those little detail those I don't know these little features to show up in the histogram, right? So it's a balancing act of um, if we did it up to 20, 20 minutes. Now it's clearly too that's clearly too wide. Like I feel like I'm losing uh, some important resolution. So I'm going to go with ten minutes. And um, all right, so now we want to do some summaries. Uh, the questions up here. Um, Okay. Describe the distribution of the arrival delay. So you can you can write some text about what you see about the shape, spread, and outliers in this plot. And then um, using histogram and appropriate summary statistics. So let's let's work on the summary statistical part. We want um, to start with the data set, and then we want to summarize. Here, let's go back over here, and so I can refer you to the summarize function. We're going to take our data set, summarize, and we're going to calculate some summaries for, for that variable, in this case arrival delays, but we're, and we'll calculate uh, what we need. All right, so let's uh, go back over here. We start with this data set, we summarize, and then we're going to fill in the things that are important to us. So uh, for sure, I always put in a sample size um, because everyone's always curious about that. Um, I'm going to calculate, I'll calculate all of them and you can decide what you want to use. All right, let's start with the mean. Is the mean, or we're going to start with arrival delay and pipe that into the mean to calculate the mean. And then we'll have the standard deviation, um, same thing, standard deviation. 
and then we'll have two more, which will be median and um, IQR, which will be capital IQR. All right, and then you can see how hard this is to read right now. Watch this. Oops. <laughs> okay. Sometimes autocomplete bites you. All right. So I just, all I did was align the equal signs. And you can see how much easier that is to read now. We've got, and it's very obvious what's happening on the right side and what the variables are on the left side. So, you know, take, take 10 seconds and align your equal signs and it will be way easier to, to read. Same thing on, over here on the right. Um, if, if you had different, uh, different situations over here, not, th not there, um, it makes it hard to read when things are not aligned. So just take, just take the time and, and do that. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what overboard is. You can do this. That that still works, um, but it's really not necessary. Um, but there are cases where aligning parentheses also makes sense. Okay, so um, all right, let's go ahead and calculate this. It should pr produce a table. We've got 68. We've got our mean and standard deviation, and we've got median and IQR. Interesting. Okay, so. You can see the effect right here of these outliers, right? The median is the middle point, the middle, the 50% mark that divides the data in half. Its value is negative 11. When the mean um, is being influenced and pulled out to the right-hand side, actually for you it's probably this way, right? <laughs> out to the right-hand side um, to f about five and a half units, six and a half units. Um, Furthermore, we know that the the interquartile range is the middle 50% of the data, how wide that is. And that's going to be, you know, mostly pretty narrowly inside this um, main part of the histogram. The standard deviation is being influenced by that outlier, right? It's, it's producing this large, not really residual, that's, we haven't really learned that word yet, but um, the large deviance from the mean you take that deviance from the mean, you square it, you add all the squared terms up, you get the variance, you take the square root of that, you get the standard deviation. And so because that is, it's contributing a large value to the variance and it increases the variance by, you know, a bit over the interquartile range. Now these two numbers, they're not going to be equal in a normal, even in a standard normal distribution. Um, the IQR represents the middle 50. In a normal distribution, the standard deviation, one standard deviation represents 64%. So uh, we expect the standard deviation to be a little bigger, but not much, and it's clearly being influenced. Okay, uh, good. We've got um, the code there that you can use to, to describe the center and spread. Let's look at the next. All right. Calculate the median and interquartile range for arrival delays of flights for that SFO Feb flights data that we made, grouped by carrier. Okay, this is cool. Um, which carrier has the most variable arrival delays? I'm going to show you two ways of doing this. Um, this is the old way, and I'll show you the new way as well. But this example, there's a very there's a function called group by. And I'll show you what that does. Let's um, Okay, let's steal this date, this code. Oh, I might even already have it in here. Let's see. Nope. <clears throat> All right, we'll steal that code. We're gonna, we're not going to group by origin. We're going to group by carrier. And then we're going to calculate some summaries. And this wants to calculate the median and interquartile range. Okay, so we've got. In fact, let's just copy all this. Oh, yeah, we should just copy copy the whole previous thing and then just add that we're grouping by. So we start with our data set, then we group by uh, carrier, and then we do our summaries. <clears throat> um, and we don't need the mean and standard deviation. Um, let me show you what each of these steps does. So we start with our data set. I'm just going to print it here, okay? It says that the data set is a tibble, 68 rows, 16 variables. There they are. And it prints as much as it can. 
and then it says there's six more variables and this is what they are okay uh, if you want to print more you can increase the you can pipe that to print width and you can print it wider um, since I mentioned it uh, print width equals infinity will print all of them so then the rows wrap until you get all of the um, excuse me the columns wrap until you get all the columns okay um, now I'm gonna run the first two lines where we do group by so now the data set is it still a tibble but notice it has this uh, attribute of groups um, I'm not sure what the five means um, but we've got is grouped by carrier and but the data set sort of looks the same it's just that it's going to perform differently when we put it into the summarize function because the summaries are going to be by group so let's now see what this result is All right. um, if we take out the group I'll just show you what that looks like as well we can compare okay so without the group we get one set of summaries with the group we have a summary carrier becomes a variable in our summaries and we've get a result for each of the carriers okay looks like there's only five carriers that go to San Francisco from New York City all right so that that sort of answers the question let me show you the modern way of doing the group by um, one of the issues about grouping uh, you know it's not really a problem for for summarize but there is uh, I will tell you that th there are situations when you're grouping by multiple variables and when you summarize you summarize by the highest level variable and that level gets dropped and it it produces a a data frame in fact maybe we'll just try it um, how about origin right I think that's okay let's run the same thing but we're we're grouped by carrier and origin all right so um, when I group by you know what let's go a little bit slower all right so let me clear this I'm gonna group by these two I get a a tibble that has groups by carrier and then origin when I summarize all of that I get an output that's still grouped by carrier origin was summarized by and all the summaries are here now it's not this isn't interesting because it's only United Airlines that flies to San Francisco from either Newark or JFK all the other ones strictly fly from G JFK um, but notice that this this um, summary table is still grouped which means later on if you start in interacting with this data frame it may behave in an unusual way so if you do group by usually like the first thing I do is I do group by and then I ungroup immediately and then I fill in the code in the middle because I want the data these summaries to be ungrouped so when you ungroup now it's a tibble there's no groups okay now that has been fixed this is sort of a bit of a a long road now but um, you know it's all part of your R education let's look at the help question mark summarize and I'm gonna clear my plot away so I can make this nice and big there is now within summarize a groups um, option or argument this didn't used to exist even you know a few months ago so um, uh, when groups is not specified it's chosen based on the number of rows um, all right so I'm looking for some details about about that but I think I think this is let's tr let's try it so some of these special arguments start with a dollar with a uh, period so we're gonna do up here let me clear things away we're gonna do dot groups equals and I think you can sort of just specify it this way carrier okay now notice um, groups by is commented out so it's not gonna run in fact um, I can be a little bit more destructive in my demo um, for the purposes of of learning 
you, you know, I don't expect you to do this part. I just want you to follow along. So let's let's run this. Ah, rats. Let's see. Let's try it in quotes. There's, there's one more. Okay, so it needs quotes to 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 find the um, that variable. Okay, um, that makes sense. Um, but I'm not going to explain why. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do, we could do carrier and origin in this C language, right? That C combines um, elements into a list. And if we do that, we should get the same result as before, except it's smart and it drops all the groups. So we have taken the data set, before it summarized it, it grouped it by both carrier and origin, it calculated the summaries, and then it automatically completely ungrouped it because here's a tibble with no groups. All right. I hope you hope hope that hope you followed all of that. Um, groups can get people in trouble. Um, maybe that has saved some of you a half hour or an hour. Uh, six to 12 months from now when you're working with real data. All right, so that was exercise four. Or was it? <laughs> uh, did that answer? Which carrier had the most, the most variable arrival delays? Okay, we're not, we weren't done. Um, so let's go back. So we've got this nice summary. Um, we're grouping by carrier, okay. What's wrong? Uh, oh, you know what? It didn't work last time either because it didn't group it by carrier. Um, something's wrong. Okay, so there's this other thing. Oh, does it does it require like tidy select? Um, hold on a second. All of Uh, okay, I guess I don't know how that works. So it's not working yet, but we knew we know group by carrier pipe, and we don't really need to ungroup this, but let's do it because it's a good thing to do. So I'm sorry, I took a detour on something I didn't quite know. Is there an example down here for dot groups? Um, we can search for dot groups. No, there's not an example. So that is an unfortunate thing about some of the documentation is that even though there are many options, there often aren't examples of every option. And so then you need to start Googling things. So, all right, I'm going to uh, leave that to an exercise for you if you wanna go investigate that. All right, the question that we're trying to answer Thank you for your, all your patience. Which carrier has the most variable arrival delays? So we can sort we can sort that by I, or we can arrange by IQR, and we want the most variable on top. So we can sort this descending. So the one that is most variable, is that what we're looking for? Yes, is at top. And we've got two tied for first place. Congratulations, Delta and United. Okay. <clears throat> All right, question five, departure delays by month. So here we're grouping by month, summarizing, and then arranging. Um, let's just go ahead down to our well, okay, which month would you expect to have the highest average delay departing from a New York City airport? That's all the airports in the database. So we're just um, calculating the mean departure time by month, and then we're arranging it to have the highest mean at the top, which is the, the longest delay. Suppose you really dislike departure delays. 
and you want to schedule your travel in a month that minimizes your potential departure delay leaving New York City. One option is to choose the month with the lowest mean departure delay. Okay. <laughs> I hope the family likes to uh, be visited in March and not in the, around the holidays. Um, another, I mean, I don't know if March is the one, we'll find out. Um, another option is to choose the month with the lowest median departure delay. Okay. Uh, what are the pros and cons of these two choices? All right, so this is more of a uh, just discussing what the pros and cons are. Okay, you don't actually need to do the calculations. Um, let's do them so we can see, and then um, and then, but you don't really need to know the answer. Um, to discuss the pros and cons. Um, all right, I'm going to save myself a little bit of time. No, that's not true. <laughs> NYC flights. And then, so we want to group by month. Oh, come on. Come on, autocomplete. Don't slow me down. Summarize. I should really turn off autocomplete for myself. So then we want to summarize um, and calculate means and medians, right? So mean and median, um, lowest mean, lowest median. And then we want to um, arrange to sort the data um, by um, sort by either median or mean, okay? Depending on what, what we want. And if we want the lowest, we want to sort in the Let's see. Choose a month with the lowest median. Choose a month with the lowest mean. Okay. So in both cases, we're just going to sort ascending so that the smallest value is at the top and the numbers get larger. So I put these comments in here because I wanted to think through the process first, and then I'll go and go back and fill in the code. Right? Sometimes, right? So I, right? This idea of writing pseudocode. Um, gives you a way to think through the entire process and then you can go in and fill in the details. Um, I find that if I do that I'm unlikely to miss any steps whereas if I start digging into the deep details on my you know on the first step here then or the second step then I sort of lose the flow of the train of thought and you know once you start trying to summarize you might be looking for a certain function and then you start Googling and then five minutes later or 15, you find the thing that you wanted and now you've sort of forgotten what you're working on. So anyway, so we're gonna calculate the mean and median. I'll just keep that comment there for a second. So we'll do the mean equals and we're looking at the departure delays. So that was departure delay and we wanna calculate the mean. And then same thing, put a comma, for median, oh come on, median, and then we're going to arrange, and so we could we could arrange it by either one or the other, right? So we can do um, median, say. Um, now median's not a great variable name because it's also a function name. Um, it ends up working because median is a variable name that's in a variable that's defined inside the data set, and all of these are working with the data inside that data frame or that tibble. So it works out, but better names for this might be um, media, mean underscore departure delay, something like that. All right, so we can get our answer to what, what it was. Um, September has the lowest, and it's tied with October. By, it's only by one minute, right? So uh, we can also take a look at what this looks like if you sort it by the mean. And let's put it in the same order, mean, median. Okay, there's the means. Okay, we, we, can, t we can sort of, here's the mean. Uh, the, notice the median ones are negative and the means are positive. That's because delays are right skewed and those outliers are pulling the mean positive. 
Um, okay, don't June and July when it's super hot, don't go. Um, December when you're getting lots of snow, or no Christmas <laughs> holidays. That's that's that because we don't see January and February down there. So holidays and the hot summer times, but fall fall's the best time if you don't want to be delayed. Now we know flying from New York in in nineteen or two thousand seventeen or whenever this data set was made. All right, so now you can go ahead and talk through like what the advantages are and disadvantages of choosing those different mean slash mean median strategies. All right, we're moving right along. <laughs> All right, uh, next, on time departure for New York City airports. Um, suppose you will be flying out of New York City and want to know which of the three major New York City airports has the best on time departure rate for departing flights. Now, getting from the city to any of those three airports, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the relative convenience of getting to those airports will definitely, in my opinion, outweigh any departure delay. But that is uh, not, not relevant here. You may consider any flight delayed for five minutes or more to be delayed. So we're going to first need to classify each flight as being on time or delayed. Oh, and they actually do that for you here. And then we're going to group flights by origin, calculate the on-time departure rate. So that's the proportion of flights that are on time. And finally, arrange those in descending order. OK. Um, so we've got some starting code here. Um, let's see. I've, anytime they give us starting code, I go ahead and put that in here. So we've got our data set. We mutate to create this departure type. And we've got a function if else, I think I introduced this to you in the R programming lesson. It has three, in fact, let me bring up the help on that. If else, it has three arguments. It has a test, which are sets of trues and falses. For any time that something is true, you do the thing that's in the second argument. And whenever it's false, you do what's in the third argument. There's a third option, which is NA, not available, if something could not be evaluated as true or false, in which case it returns an NA again. Okay, so in this case, we look at the departure delay variable. Let's um, just take a look at um, departure delay. And why don't we look at a, oh, how about, oops, how about a summary of that, just that variable, okay? So the, the median is negative two, the mean is about 13 minutes, uh, the maximum is 1300, the minimum is 21 minutes. Okay, that's that's what we're looking at. So if that departure delay is less than five minutes, positive five minutes, then we're going to create a label called on time. Otherwise, we're putting a label called delayed, and we're putting that into this new variable departure type. So let's go ahead and create that new variable, and let's take a look at it right away. Um, New York City flights departure delay. Okay, and let's make a table of that. Oh, that's not very helpful. That's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to do departure, the new variable name, departure type. Sorry about that. Ah, that's better. So, oh, this is pretty good. Um, on time, 22,000, delayed 10,000. So about two thirds of the time is on time. That's pretty good. Um, here I'm making a bar plot where I'll just, I'll just plot it. Um, where for each origin on the x-axis, right? So that's Newark, JFK, and LaGuardia. LaGuardia is the third one. Um, we're going to fill. Fill is the color fill, okay? Um, the departure type. So we've got delayed is red and on time is blue. Okay, and we're creating, we're plotting bars. And the default is that they're, they are stacked. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, it looks like I give you a whole bunch of code here. Maybe, maybe almost all of it. So here we're going to create a new data set or summary. So sum is a, my way of saying summary on time. So we start with the data set. We group by origin. 
that's the these three airports we summarize um, to get the on time OT departure rate that's we're adding up or we're counting the number of departure times that are equal to on time so we get a number and then we divide that by the total number and that's all that's for each each origin so we're doing that three times and then we are, are we arrange all of the full data set by the, descending by the departure rate so let's let's just take a look at this by little section okay so if I start by taking the full data set and grouping by origin it all it does is create this groups attribute then we're going to summarize and we're going to create a new variable called on time departure rate and we've got these proportions one for each origin and then we're going to arrange that uh, descending so LaGuardia is the most on time by a few percentage points um, next JFK and then Newark is is the worst okay, but not like uh, substantially different 10 10 well 10 points behind LaGuardia that's pretty that that is, is either a big difference or not depending on how important that is to you okay <clears throat> um, the last part is why don't we create a a plot um, of these numbers all right so I'm going to show you uh, it's a type of bar plot but the bar plot is assuming that you've got data that has frequencies um, like the original let's see well uh, because it's going to count up the plot that we have over here it's counting up how many on time how many delayed and it's putting it's putting these bars up so if you want to take use the summarized data the way we have down here and we've got this on time departure rate as our colors okay um, then geome call for columns is what will create that plot so here's a draft of that Ooh, let's see did I do something wrong um, oh you know what it's not fill let's make it the y-axis okay so now we've got or each origin is the x-axis and then the y-axis is the proportion right so origin is the x-axis y-axis are the proportions um, the other thing that might be nice is to set the axes so that the y limits goes from 0 to 1 okay so now you have a sense of where 1 is and where 0 is okay. all right uh, that's I think that's everything for that I want to show you for that all right so now we've got more practice we've got one two three questions to end this are you all still here there's no way but thank you for those of you who are still here I hope you're learning stuff and I hope you're doing the typing with me and running it and answering the questions as you go all right uh, exercise 7 mutate the data frame so that it includes a new variable that contains the average speed okay so now we have to think about how to calculate speed <clears throat> um, the average speed traveled by a plane for each flight in miles per hour okay um, I, I don't think we need the hint but it's distance divided by the number of hours of travel um, note that the airtime is given in minutes okay so we need to do a little bit of conversion there um, all right we can do that so we go over to exercise seven um, let's start with our data frame so New York City flights um, we're going to update the data frame and then we're going to mutate to create this average sp speed so how about average oops AVG for average speed equals so we've got distance divided by airtime um, I'm I've sort of memorized a lot about the data set so let's look at the structure 
this is what I would typically do, right? Find the distance variable, okay, and then find the airtime variable, okay? And it's in minutes, right? So if we were to just do this, we'd have the speed in miles per minute, but we want miles per hour. So I'm actually going to take the minutes and divide that by 60. So now the units of the denominator are hours. Okay. Um, let's then print the New York flights data set. Um, oops. Sorry, I'm getting used to that keystroke. And uh, we'll take a look at the, the result. So now we've got this average speed, and now you right. Whenever you calculate a number, interpret it and make sure it makes sense. So 474 miles per hour is that a sensible speed for a jet? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, jets, um, most jets fly at a percentage of Mach, so like point like you know uh, 0 0.70 Mach. So that's percentage of the speed of sound. Uh, speed of sound, if I remember, is like 787, it's either miles per hour or, or nautical miles per hour. Um, and this is this is a sensible fraction of that. It's more than half the speed of sound, or in some of these are about half the speed of sound. So I, I think we're, we're in the right ballpark. Um, some of these shorter flights um, are much slower because they spend more time climbing and descending rather than in, in the fast cruise speed. So th this all looks about right to me. So um, looks like we've done it. Um, does it ask you anything else? No, it just says calculate it. Okay, we've done it. So you know. So in this case, you would just say like C code. All right. And in that, uh, you know. Um, speeds are within expected ranges. Um, and maybe another way to, instead of printing the whole data frame, is you could just do a summary of the new variable average speed. Uh, one nice part about this is that it gives you the min and max, and that helps identify like really unusual values. Um, 700 is probably too fast. So there might be, you know, some issues of, of data in there. 76 is definitely way too slow. Um, so that's maybe like a really short flight where they end up being in the traffic pattern or in a holding pattern for, um, to be sequenced in, in to arrive. So th things like that could explain that. But, you know, definitely within the, the middle 50%, those are sensible numbers, 350 to, to 440. <clears throat> Okay, good. Um, oh yeah, speeds are within expected ranges, um, except the most extreme values. All right, number eight, um, scatter plot of speed and distance. So all, all these questions now are just rapid fire, so I'm going to re just read them off of the Quarto file. Make a scatter plot of the average speed versus distance. Describe the relationship between average speed and distance. Okay, we're going to use geom point. Sounds good. Um, do we have any code that we can start with? For sure. Let's go steal some of this um, ggplot code. Okay, so we start with the data set. This is like the New York City flights. Um, the x axis. So we want to do average speed versus distance. So let's do average speed on the y-axis and distance, excuse me, <laughs> average speed on the y-axis and distance on the x-axis. Um, we'll use geom point instead of geom call. And let's just start with a basic scatter plot. All right, start with the basics and then build in complexity if you need to. Ah. Look at this point up here. Naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> uh, this is an unusual point. There's like one flight that went some this intermediate distance. 
right? So that could have been a um, um, a diversion for weather or something where they had to land at a different airport than usual. Um, all of these that are in vertical rows are definitely between one airport and another. Um, you know, a regular flight path that's that's done multiple times a year. Okay, um, cool. Is there anything else to to do there? Um, well, we might want to follow the the average, right? So we could put a geom smooth in here. See what that looks like. Oops. Using the uh, uh, general additive model that they it uses that instead of the low s smoother when there's lots and lots of points. So this is nice. It sort of follows the 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 average. I like it. Um, it helps you, helps your eye follow the the mean, uh, particularly on these low points where there's um, steepness. Sometimes it's hard for, hard for the eye to to find the the middle of steeply rising points. Um, like this, so that I think the blue is a little bit helpful. It doesn't look like it really captures the mean of the very lowest value, um, but th that's not really our concern at the moment, just an observation. Um, okay, we made a scatter plot. And then replicate the following plot. All right, so we just need to, let me, oops, I wanted to zoom out a little bit to see, see the whole thing. So we've got arrival delay on the Y, departure delay on the X, and color is carrier. Those should be the only three um, that we that we need. Oh, the data frame plotted contains flights from American Airlines, Delta, and United. So we also need to filter our data set to have those three airlines. All right, <clears throat> I'm up to it. So there's several ways you can do this. Um, let's let's copy this code because we've already got code for a scatter plot. Um, we wanted, I've already forgotten, arrival on the Y, departure on the X. Arrival on the Y, uh, delay, arrival, delay, yep, departure, delay, okay, um, and no smooth points. Oh, and we also have got color, right? Okay, let's not worry about that at the moment. we we'll sort of build up to it. <clears throat> there are a lot of points, so it's it, taking a lot, a lot of time to place all the points. So we basically have the right idea, right? That's starting to look similar. Now we want just these three airlines. Uh, recall. Oh, let, actually, let's do let's do one thing before we do that. Color is carrier. So let's do that next. So color equals carrier. Okay, we'll make that plot. And then we'll filter it down to our three airlines. So now we've got all those carriers, all different colors. All right, and now we need American Airlines, Delta Airlines, and United. So I th think, I think I already know what those codes are. Um, we've probably got AA, I think we've got DL for Delta and United. I think that's it. Let's go double check because we had a key up here. Um, American, AA, Delta, DL, United, UA. Okay, so we've got the three designators. Now what do we do? So we can create a new data set or we could just the data set that we're putting in here, we could filter it right here. So we could pass that to filter and say we want carrier. Wherever carrier is in this list of these three. And we need to put quotes around each of those. Okay. And at this point, we might start breaking the ggplot into multiple lines so you can read it easier. So d the data is this. The data set where it's filtered and carrier is just in this list. In fact, let's take a look at just that portion. Right? You can always look at a subset of a longer expression and, and examine it. You just select it and print it. So this has 13, almost 14,000 rows instead of the 
let's see, environment, New York flights instead of the 32,000, right? So it's, it's clearly a subset. If we just wanted to check, we could also um, pull, pull the carrier column out and make a table. Sorry, I'm, cro I'm using different sets of um, pipes. Make a table. So I'm just verifying that, in fact, those are the three carriers that we have. If if one of these had a zero in there, that would say that we we probably put in the wrong wrong uh, identifier for that airline. So this looks great. Um, let's make our plot. I can't wait. All right. Did we duplicate that plot? Let's see, we've got reds and greens up here, three of them. Reds and greens, three of them. Um, you can click on zoom and it should pop out a window and you can look at just that and you can make it larger, right? Um, it doesn't make the points bigger. Um, I'll show you a couple things, right? So this will be the last part of this video, obviously. We're over an hour. Hanging in there, guys. All right, so for Geome Point, if we look at the help, uh, I'm going to clear this plot for a moment. Um, there's these dot, dot, dots, which are other aesthetics that you can set. And those include um, size, shape, um, etc. So you can just put in here like size equals one. Now you'd think that one was would be the default size. It isn't. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but one often makes something a little bit bigger. I don't, I don't really know what the default size is. Um, let's make threes and see. Okay, now we got some big, big points. Ah, look at this. That looks almost identical. So I bet they used a three when they made theirs. Um, you can also make, put alpha, right? So alpha is the opacity, how opaque the the data are, what if we make it one fourth? That means you'd need four points to lay on top of each other so it's completely opaque where light doesn't shine through. And that helps you sort of identify how much density there is when points lay on top of each other. Um, I'm, in this plot, I don't think it really helps us. Um, let me set that to 1 20th. And we've got really light points and then we've got this really dark density. So, you know, almost everything is right around this middle part or the, that bottom left corner. There, as we noticed earlier, there, there really isn't a lot of uh, departure delay from our histograms. So, all right, we made a beautiful plot. Uh, once you replicate this plot, determine roughly what the cutoff point is for departure delays where you can still expect to get to your destination on time. Okay, what does that mean to get to your destination on time? That means your arrival delay is zero. Um, you know what, make, let's make these points a little bit larger. Um, and we'll zoom so we can um, look at this a little better. So arrival delays, if, you're, if you get there on time, you're at, you're at zero, right? You don't mind getting there early, right? So a negative arrival delay below zero is is a great thing um, but at what departure delay what was the question guarantees can can you let me just read the whole thing um, determine the cutoff point for for a departure delay where you can still expect to get to your destination on time okay so what departure delay on the x-axis sort of gives you the expectation that you would arrive on time. Well, even at even at negative values of departure delay, say here, in fact, let's let me annotate this for the sake of um, you can learn this as well. So we, we want to do a geome vertical line and we want the x intercept to equal, I don't know, let's do like negative 10. And let's see if I did it right. Yeah, okay, good. I think I'll be able to prove my point with that. <clears throat> okay, 
Good. So there's negative 10 minutes on a departure delay. That means you've left the airport 10 minutes early. There's no delay. But notice all the points where you're still arriving late, right? This first line, right, the second line is 200. This first line is 100, 100 minutes. That's more than an hour and a half, right? So even if you leave early, you might still arrive more than an hour late. So I don't know. This is not. I don't think this is, this question is well thought through because there's no departure delay that gives you the expectation that you should arrive on time. You know. Oh, you know what? Something that we could we could add to this is what if we put a smoother on here, All right? Because that's going to track the middle, and maybe that's a way of of thinking about um, expectation, right? If it's if it's on average. Then maybe maybe you should have expe some expectation. Um, Geom smooth. Let's do. Oh, I think the method. Um, let's see. Well, we're getting down into the weeds here because notice it it made a separate line for each each group. So I'm trying to do group equals one, so we get one line. And then, I don't know something weird's happening. So. <clears throat> um, okay, well, I guess I'm not easily seeing, oh, you, we could do like color equals uh, yellow. Oh, oh, good. We can see the yellow line on top there. Let's zoom in. Okay, maybe this is a good, good way of thinking about expectation. I clicked on Zoom. It's creating a new window and plotting all those points. So it's taking a moment, I think. Oh, well, here it is. Um, so if we look down here, it looks like this line almost crosses 0, 0. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's positive. Maybe it's slightly on the positive side when it crosses the 0 y-axis. It's hard to tell. Yeah, so maybe it's like about five minutes or ten minutes or at the most. So maybe if you leave within five minutes of departure time, you can expect to arrive on time. Otherwise, your arrival time is is positive on average. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it. That's that's probably a good way. Um, it's it's not um, it's not clear what what expectation means in this. Um, scenario. That's all. That's why I'm sort of hemming and hawing a little bit. All right. Well, I think we learned a bunch. Um, one thing I didn't do with you is sort of do one part, like render it on our way. So hopefully we don't have any errors. All of our code ran as we did each chunk. So we should expect that it will all run, but we could very well get an error. It did all run. So that's nice. Um, if we come back over here to our assignment and refresh it, I pressed F5, you can do, you know, the refresh curly. And hopefully in here we've got, there's our plots, etc. Uh, okay, I like that yellow line. That was a good choice. Sometimes it's hard to choose colors sometimes. I, I could have said white. White probably would have been pretty good too. Um, yellow is a little better because it um, gives some contrast from the background. So, all right, I'm happy with what we did here. Sorry it takes so long. Um, you know, data analysis does take a long time. It requires a lot of thought and careful planning and um, really careful execution. So I, I hope by watching me, uh, you know, demonstrate the process that you'll, you'll gain some expectation about what it takes because um, you can certainly watch some videos online where people zip through this stuff because they have practiced and rehearsed it. I mean, I have practiced and rehearsed this stuff too, but I need to take you through it at a, a pace that you can learn from and that gives you a, some sort of a true expectation about this does take, take a while. These are the different considerations. That's what I'm trying to provide to you as a mentor. All right. <laughs> I'm all done. See you in the next one.